this is a very important undertaking. Uh, and I think it's extremely important now that we sort of parse the decision and shine as much light as we can on each and every one of its facets. Um, John Meacham reminded us in the current Newsweek of Herman Wauk's profound observation, the beginning of the end of wars lies in remembrance. Uh, and there can't be remembrance uh, until we have painstaking recreation, study, analysis, debate. Uh, and um, so um, uh, uh, this is an extremely important effort and just absolutely delighted here that there are not only many old hands uh, like Mike Hess and Paul Hughes and Mike Meese here, but there are also um, uh, a number of younger people from think tanks uh, uh, and uh, obviously the staffs around town um, who will sort of carry this uh, uh, effort uh, into the future. Um, the effort is important for four other reasons. Uh, first, Iraq uh, is a great expense in terms of blood and treasure, political capital, uh, and time. Um, it's a seminal historical event. Secondly, it was a flawed decision making. Uh, it showed a uh, flawed decision making and very slow and painful adaptation um, to reality. Um, and uh, over and over, as I was doing my own scribbling on this issue, I, I kept thinking, how did so many smart, hardworking, and experienced people do such an inadequate job for so long? Um, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I suppose the answer to the question is, well, when you get it wrong from the first assumption, uh, you're in deep kimchi. Uh, thirdly. Um, OIF comes in an important inflection point for U.S. power, indeed U.S. hegemony. Um, uh, OIF may, in fact, years later, be thought of as the high watermark uh, of U.S. hegemony in the world. And where that goes uh, is an important issue. Um, um, we are... Uh, here uh, at the feet of a lesson in the limits of power, um, uh, a very, very tough lesson. Uh, 100,000 Iraqis, 4,000 Americans, uh, and now we're knocking on the door of a trillion dollars uh, uh, in expenditures. Finally, um, the uh, SSI series comes after the first two waves of OIF scholarship. So many great books uh, on the war, two by Tom Ricks, two, soon to be two, by Michael Gordon, Linda Robinson, James Kitfield, Dexter Filkins, um, and uh, uh, my colleague speaking today here, Greg Jaffe, uh, also has a wonderful book, uh, which is sort of a biographical account of uh, some of the major actors. So uh, uh, we, we're now at the point where we can assess the first draft of history. Um, updating it, taking it forward, finding out new things, um, answering questions. Um, uh, a few words about uh, Steve's uh, excellent monograph. I haven't read his surge yet, but um, I too uh, am a believer uh, that the surge was uh, um, a, almost serendipitous uh, in its success. Uh, I think that's uh, an ext it's extremely important to look at all of the variables. I know for a few months in the United States, uh, people, uh, particularly in the armed forces, were patting themselves on the back, um, and the supposition of what many of them were saying was that somehow um, the addition of 30,000 U.S. soldiers, most of whom were, were sent to Baghdad, had somehow turned the war around. Uh, there was a lot more going on uh, than that. And the unity between the previous strategy and the surge strategy, I think, uh, um, uh, is a, an extremely important issue. Uh, but that said, I haven't read Steve's account, uh, but uh, uh, I, I liked his uh, opening comments on it. Um, uh, Steve's uh, first volume of this series of uh, uh, nine or ten, or no one is quite sure how many volumes uh, in, in this, uh, 
but I, I'm I'm of the opinion you you the, the number can't be high enough. Um, uh, it's an excellent kickoff piece and one of the few that's focused on the decision to go to war itself in isolation from another issue, the war planning effort. And the war planning effort um, comes to dominate a lot of these discussions. And so, you know, isolating the decision made by the president to go to war, uh, as, as indeterminate as there might have been, I thought was very good. Um, Steve's effort, as he mentioned, focuses on the 911 context, the legacy of fear and anxiety about the future, the desire to exploit 911, and the uses of the use of what he calls the crisis style versus deliberate decision making. Um, uh, he also uh, talks about the lack of military input, the actual decision to go to war. Of course, there was a lot of military input into that other related issue, the war plan. Uh, other factors were present too, and many of them were covered uh, also by Steve. Um, one was the sense of unfinished business uh, from the Gulf War, um, the uh, waning fortunes of the sanctions regime. We forget we were controlling Saddam Hussein through a sanctions regime which had become increasingly illegitimate. Um, one of my pet rocks was uh, the role of Northern and Southern Watch. We were flying the wings off of our Air Force in an attempt to contain Saddam Hussein. Um, the role of poor intelligence, of course, will be talked about in subsequent volumes, I'm sure. Um, so we have, on the one hand, the role of poor intelligence, and on the other hand, the devastating effects of ignoring excellent intelligence, analysis, and even studies by the Army War College. Uh, uh, and uh, ironically, uh, I was the, the DASD for stability operations at the time, and um, um, we wanted to know more about the, 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 the world after the war. And so uh, uh, my predecessor in the job that I held, Jim Shear, was the deputy head of uh, uh, INSS, and we held a conference. And we got in a room just like this one. Actually, we had a couple of rooms like this one. We, had, we got every expert in America who could spell Iraq. And people, uh, we probably had, um, at, at any one point in these two or three days, um, the vast majority of people who truly understood Iraq, spoke the languages, had studied in any great depth. And we talked solely on a non-attribution basis, uh, and we produced not 10 monographs, we produced a five or six page memo and turned around and sent it to everyone in the Pentagon uh, above the rank of Sergeant First Class. And, um, and uh, <laughs> we concluded, by the way, that the absolute most important thing the United States had to do the day after the fighting stop was to secure Iraq and particularly the major cities uh, and uh, the notion that instability, destabilization was going to happen was taken as a given. Um, I, I, it, this is probably the least read memo in history. Uh, but I really feel bad because we paid OSD policy money uh, to uh, create this absolutely prophetic document that uh, only I and Paul use and, and uh, a few others appear to have absorbed. Uh, but uh, in any case, how are such things ignored? How is it that you take one piece of intelligence and you build a world on it, and then you find another piece of intelligence and you go, ooh, I don't like that one? How is it that you have a study at the Army War College, which is just an absolutely magnificent study, came in January, a few months after uh, our previous study, uh, and then somehow the Department of Defense cannot arrange a briefing for people in the interagency who were interested in hearing uh, the full study. Uh, these things are sort of decision pathologies. And it's wrong for us to go ahead and see how, how does this all make sense? Let me tell you, that's the wrong question because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because uh, while this thing mirrors rationality, it also mocks rationality uh, uh, in the way it is. Some of the other factors that were key, the effects of the Cheney-Rumsfeld 
mind meld on the national security system. Uh, Rothkopf, in his book on the history of the National Security Council, called the, the unity between Cheney and Rumsfeld as a thumb on the scales of national security decision making. Uh, not illegal, not wrong, but certainly a factor, something to be, to be studied. And finally, uh, what I call the dizzy with success fa factor that came from our operations in Afghanistan. Um, and after Afghanistan, the song playing in our heads was, ain't no stopping us now. Uh, and of course, uh, we once again uh, proved that old bit of folk wisdom uh, that nothing fails like success. Uh, in OSD at the time, we said that the reasons for going to war were the three T's and WMD. Um, the first T was terrorist relations, and Saddam's relations with inter terrorist groups were intense. Um, Stephen Hayes has, I think, probably uh, the best piece uh, about this. Um, and by the way, I never met anyone in the Pentagon who thought Saddam Hussein had anything to do with 911. Uh, but he did, in fact, have relations with Al Qaeda. Uh, and Al Qaeda's, what turned out to be Al Qaeda's surrogate in the country, uh, Ansar al Islam. Um, uh, the second T, uh, Saddam was a threat in the region, a very unpredictable player, a danger to his neighbors. The third T, he was a tyrant, a tyrant of, of absolutely no limits, uh, a tyrant who would use WMD against his own citizens. But these were all sort of supporting players. The real star of this exercise in rationality was Saddam and WMD. This was the magnet rationale, uh, it, and it brought nearly, uh, I would say, it brought the majority of the people into the church. Um, two basic facts, Saddam had a large inventory. He was working uh, on a program. Uh, this was neatly encapsulated in the October uh, uh, NIE. And uh, there are lots of stories about, you know, yellow cake and things happening in Niger and aluminum tubes. All of that was a sideshow. The two key things were had a massive inventory, had active programs. And the NIE in October of 2002 concluded, th and that within a decade, he would have nuclear weapons. Wow, that's an eye opener. Um, and of course, we were fixated on 911. Could it be worse? Yes, it could be worse. It could be an attack, not with airsats, weapons of destruction, uh, mass destruction, but real weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and if you believed in the two basic uh, facts about Saddam's WMD, you were worried about terrorists and WMD. Well, um, that's um, uh, how you how you get into such a position. Um, so, um, uh, is there an abiding lesson here? Um, uh, I, I recommend in Steve's monographs uh, uh, th these few uh, uh, paragraphs toward the conclusion. He says, strategic decision making entails a projection of expected benefits, risks, and costs of a course of action. Rational. This is shaped by the worldviews and inclinations of policymakers uh, and by recent events. The worldviews and inclination of policymakers within the Bush administration, in combination with the 911 attacks, led them to use a maximalist assessment of the risks and cost of inaction, of leaving Hussein in power, and a minimalist assessment of the costs and risks of military uh, intervention. And um, this is what Winston Churchill, if he had a seat at the table, might have said about that, uh, as he said in, in, in the 1930s. Let us learn our lessons. Never, never believe any war will be smooth and easy, or that anyone who embarks on the strange voyage can measure the tides and hurricanes he will encounter. The statement, statesman who yields to war fever must realize that once the signal is given, he is no longer the master of policy, but the slave of unforeseeable and uncontrollable events. Antiquated war offices, weak, incompetent, or arrogant commanders, untrustworthy allies, hostile neutrals, 
malignant fortune, ugly surprises, awful miscalculation, all of these take their seats at the council board on the morrow of a declaration of war. And uh, I uh, once said to a friend that perhaps uh, we should have that tattooed on the eyeball of anyone who ever becomes president of the United States. I'll stop there.